Amen. So thankful for the station and, um, and what God's doing in this hour. All right, guys, let's jump into, for just the next 15, 20 minutes, um, into our relationship series, Praise God. And we're going to talk about open hearts. We have this phrase, open hearts, open hearts. You know, that when we live an open life, it opens up other people. When we become vulnerable, um, it opens up other people to be vulnerable. It takes a freedom to do that. And sometimes we think that our relationship with God is separated from our relationship with people, but it's not true. Our relationship with God is directly connected to our relationship with people. Our love for God is related to our love for people. In fact, the way we can see how much we love God is in the way we love people. I think that this is one of the greatest values of heaven. You know, Scripture says that when you pray, when you worship, when you bring a sacrifice in your worship and you have something against someone or someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice at the altar and go and resolve that relational thing. You know what it speaks of? Priority. That heaven values this priority called relationship. When we take communion, the Bible says that we, we uh, observe the body that we discern the body of Christ, which is actually relationships. It's people. We have to discern the body when we take communion, and that's connected to our communion with God. Do you believe that? And so those two things are directly connected, and I want us to see it that way because it really is that way. In fact, Jesus says this, by this they will know that you are my disciples when they see the way you love one another. It's interesting that he didn't use anything else to identify those who are his. He didn't use gift. He didn't say, by this they will know you are my disciples when you heal the sick. Even though that's needed, that's powerful, but there's something higher than the gift. Right? And that's love. And so he says, this is going to be the way the world is going to identify you that you are my disciples. By the way they watch you love one another. And then he gives us this call. He says, love the world, love people the way I have loved you. Wow. That almost seems impossible. That seems like a lot. And I, I want to just speak a, a few thoughts on this and give us some scriptures. Last Sunday I read this in transition, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5. Paul is writing this. They even did more than we had hoped for their first action. Say with me, first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us just as God wanted them to their first action was to give themselves to the Lord but the result of that is they begin to give themselves to each other it's the it's the it's the word konania it's it's what the church was built on in Acts 2 konania is is the word for fellowship and that can only be experienced relationally but that word konania for the is a sharing together is such a, a union such an intimacy that we're called into that they had all things in common and they knew every need and distributed according to each need you're talking about thousands of people being added to the church and they lived in such close relationships that they knew every need that was in the room without social media right without the internet without text messages it was relational and the Lord added to that context those who were being saved daily look what Paul writes in 2nd Corinthians 6 11. we have spoken freely to you Corinthians and open wide our hearts to you I speak as to my children 
open wide your hearts also. 1 Thessalonians 2, 7. But we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother, mother tenderly cares for her own children. In the same way, we had a fond affection for you and were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you have become very dear to us. This is so important that we grow into this kind of life relationally, that we respond to the invitation of love to know and to be known. Look at the prayer of Jesus in John 17, 20. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. They all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me I have given them and that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. It's interesting that the love of God is revealed in that context. That the world will know that you have loved them. That when they are united into one, they come to that knowledge of the love of the Father for them. It's almost like children who find love in the context of family. Right? They find love, the definition of love is revealed to them in the context of family. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known you that you sent me, and have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. The love with which you loved me, this is what Jesus is saying, may be in them. You know, sometimes we have expectations in our relationships and people around us don't meet our expectations and we build walls. Have you noticed that when you think back to when you were a child, you were a lot more free like, you would say a lot more things. You would do a lot more things. And as you grew, you experienced rejection. You have experienced maybe someone laughing at what you're saying, rejecting you in some way, putting you down. And those experiences cause us to, like, be safe. You know what I mean? Where you, where you don't give yourself permission to be open because you're protecting something and maybe even hurt and maybe even offended. And so there's expectations. And the invitation to live this open life and an open heart uh, can be painful. And it can be hard unless the father that loved Jesus and that love that he loved Jesus with would be in us. Because it's, it's crazy, right? Before Jesus starts his ministry... The voice from heaven and the father speaking over Jesus like, this is my son and whom I'm waiting, please, this is my beloved. He was identified by the words and the affection of the father and externally went through rejection, false accusations, right? Mockery and even death on the cross, but was able, hanging on the cross, to pray for those who persecuted him. To pray for those who crucified him. On the cross with pierced hands, pierced feet, he used his last breaths to lead another person into the kingdom. Right? Which means Jesus to the last moment stayed fully open to humanity that was crucifying him. Like the love of God is so much deeper than what we know love to be in humanity. And so... When the Father's love is poured out into our hearts, when it remains in us, it gives us the ability to live this out. 
Because I think the disease of selfishness can only be destroyed, for lack of better words, by being satisfied. When we find satisfaction in the love of the Father, we encounter freedom to love people the way he called us to love people. It's, it's interesting. It doesn't say that you are seated in Christ. It says that we are seated in Christ. That, that it, yes, there's an individual relationship, but all together we make up the body of Christ. The church is the body. Christ and we together are called to be seated in Christ in heavenly places. Can't love Jesus and not love his body. For in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. Colossians 2 9. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. You have been brought to fullness itself. And in closing, I want to read this story in John chapter 20, verse 25. You guys remember the story of the doubting Thomas? Um, or I would say maybe the Thomas that was pursuing intimacy. Because I don't think and this is just another thought or another way to look at this. When Thomas said, I won't believe until I touch the nails, put my fingers through those hands that were pierced. Until I see him, until I behold him, until I touch him, I won't believe. I, you can look at it from this perspective that he was doubting or that he was longing for intimacy. Like, I want to see him with my own eyes. I want to touch him with my own hands. I want to encounter him. And I won't settle until I do. And one thing that's true about Jesus is first, he's a pursuer. One thing that's true about Jesus is that he will always feed the hungry. And so when we pick up the story, this is after crucifixion and after resurrection when the report is going around that Jesus Christ is no longer in the grave that just like he said on the third day he was raised to life and he's appearing to the disciples and he would do that for the next 50 days and or 40 days and he would appear to as many as 500 so in this process as this was happening it says there so the other disciples told him we have seen the Lord but he said to them I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hands into the side, into his side, I will not believe. You know what he's asking for here is to put his hand into an open wound. And sometimes that's the price of intimacy. It's actually sometimes painful so Jesus when he came into that room he said Thomas put your hand into my side so that you can know me and so that I can know you and look what it says here a week later his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them Though the doors were locked, say with me, locked. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Sometimes there's relationships in our life where the doors are locked. Sometimes there's relationships in our life where Things happened and someone hurt you or someone said something and those doors seem to be locked. And we kind of say, well, they don't want anything to do with me, so I'm just going to be right here. And that's their problem. Yes and no. Because whatever affects our heart is our problem. 
and we have to deal with it because what we don't understand sometimes is one wall towards one person is actually a wall to every relationship. Because we think we can separate this relationship, kind of put it in a box, and go and pursue intimacy in other relationships. It's not true. Over time, you'll recognize that that wall became the wall to every relationship in your life. And so sometimes we have to go through the walls of locked doors. And Jesus appeared in the room even though the door was locked. And, and look what it says here. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Do you see how his view of Jesus changed. He was doubting, he was questioning, but as Jesus came into that room and allowed Thomas to experience him relationally, his view of Jesus was corrected. And he said, my Lord and my God. And a lot of times we experience broken relationships because our view of that person is not right. It's defined by our experience. It's defined by a, a failed expectation. It's defined by, you know, a moment in the flesh. It's defined by whatever thing that happened. But when we remain in the love of the Father, we become pursuers. We walk through those walls and something is restored. There's this thing called reconciliation. And reconciliation begins to happen. And we begin to flourish as a people. And this is not just individually, this is the call to the community. This is the call to the church. This is the call to the family. Where we stop being safe in relationships, build our walls, you know, and, 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 and make sure that no one hurts us. Love is fearless. And I'm not saying there's no place for like boundaries and abuse. I'm not taking this to the extreme. But I am saying, God is calling us out of isolation. God is calling us out of maybe some of those places we call safe and become wild and dangerous and become pursuers. John 15, 9, it says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept the Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. You see, there's a joy that is released when we live in intimacy, when we live in konania, when we live well relationally, when we live healthy relationally. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for another, for, for one's friend. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Everything I have made known to you. And for intimacy to happen, it requires for there to be transparency. In other words, what Jesus is saying, like we started in this relationship where, you know, servants, slaves, but I no longer call you that because relationally we've come to a place where there's no more secrets. Where everything that I am, I have made known to you. I have opened it up relationally. And I now call you friends. And then he defines this relationship and he says, greater love, there is no greater love than this, than when a friend lays down his life for another. And that's the definition of love. It's sacrificial. It's giving. It's not selfish. It's not self-centered. It's not a bunch of expectations and lists and who can qualify to be your friend. You can be rich in relationships. You can have godly friendships. You can have uh, people you call family. Pe 
people that know everything about you, people that believe in you, people that can stand alongside of you. And I think because we don't have that, we fail so much in hard times. Because there's something powerful. There's an oil released in harmony and unity. And the Bible says that when two, two are better than one, when two or three agree, when there is this union, the, the threefold cord is not easily broken. So there's, there's an anointing there. There's momentum there. There is health there. And, you know, they say relationships is the greatest liability and the greatest asset. And it's so true. I want you to stand to your feet this morning. I want you to just welcome the love of the Father. That the love with which the Father has loved Jesus. That right now, it would just be poured out on you. That His love is the only thing that can satisfy you, that can make you complete, that can make you whole. And so right now, would you just, just open up your hands and just, just ask him to just fill you with his love. Ask the Holy Spirit to pour out the love of the Father into your heart to make you satisfied, to make you drop some of those expectations that maybe you and I have put on our relationships. The love of the Father. The love of the Father. The love of the Father. Just begin to receive the love of the Father. Allow His love to satisfy you. Allow His love to make you whole. Allow His love to define you. Maybe moments that you can even remember now that come to your mind of rejection or moments when someone didn't believe in you or moments when someone said something to you and it's actually become a wall to your destiny, a wall to your future, a wall to your marriage, a wall to your relationships. That's become an idol. That's become the object of worship. And right now the love of God wants to confront those places of fear in our life so Lord we just ask you that our life our value and who we are would be defined by your voice defined by your love this morning in Jesus name in Jesus name and I want to just invite as we come into worship if relationally there's brokenness in your life and maybe you have the greatest explanation how it's not you, but it's them. You know, it's what they did, it's what he said, it's what that person didn't do. Because most of the time our offense is connected to what someone didn't do rather than what they did. But I want to invite us into reconciliation. And sometimes the healing that we're looking for, it happens relationally. The Bible says, confess your sins to one, other, one another so that you may be healed. You confess your sins to God, you're forgiven. But confession, in other words, taking this relationally brings healing. And so there's something about doing this relationally and God inviting us into a reconciliation in our relationships that brings a joy, that brings a new anointing that brings the kingdom of God into our midst and there is there is a definition of the fact that the Lord is here because of the way we love each other isn't that beautiful and one of the ways we can take this wall down is by releasing forgiveness and sometimes maybe that person is not even alive anymore or maybe that person is not in this room but you can confess it to someone and healing will come into your heart and into your soul so as we step into this moment of worship I want to invite you as you examine your heart with the Holy Spirit if there's if there's walls in my life if there's people that I haven't forgiven if there is bitterness that I have if there's if my heart is hardened towards any person God is calling me to a purity God is calling me to a reconciliation and that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our own hearts 
amazing. So let's just lift up our voices. Let's just receive the ministry of the Holy Spirit to us. And during this moment of worship, would you just come? Would you just come? Would you just respond? And, and, and I, I want to actually ask the team to also come. And I want you to just confess it because something happens when we confess it, when we bring it into light. The Bible says, walk in the light, walk in fellowship. And then the blood of Jesus, it purifies us. Amen.